Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Josh Bendit. Uh, Dr. Bendit is a professor of medicine at the University of Washington in Seattle, one of the greatest academic institutions in the world. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Bandit is also the Medical Director of Respiratory Care Services at the University of Washington Medical Center. And in his work, he has developed a long interest in caring for individuals with neuromuscular disease and respiratory issues, for which we are obviously very grateful. Uh, also, during Dr. Bandit's presentation, I'm hoping he can address what happened to the Washington Husky football team this year. <laughs> so, Dr. Bandit, the lectern sure. is yours. Thank you. Great. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I, I can't tell you what happened. We had high hopes, but uh, things didn't go quite the way we planned. Uh, anyway, thank you for having me. This is a real honor. Uh, I've been down to San Diego many times. I've never actually been in the Salk Institute, and uh, what a pleasure, really. So, uh, yes, I am from Seattle, um, and <laughs> I feel like I'm still in Seattle. Um, <laughs> Uh, Louis, who you'll be hearing later from, Boitano, he and I went and played golf yesterday and it was absolutely pouring rain, but we got some wonderful views of the uh, ocean. So anyway, um, what I'm going to talk about today is um, how the um, neuromuscular system is involved in breathing. As a pulmonologist, when I went through training, um, it was really just infrequently mentioned uh, how the breathing muscles, nerves, spinal cord, et cetera, were involved in breathing. And it was only later that I got involved with this and found out how really critical it is. So what I'm going to do is review the components of what I call the neuromuscular respiratory system or pump. I'm going to talk about sort of three ways that there can be problems with the respiratory system that can affect people with neuromuscular disease, uh, what we do for monitoring of patients in clinic, what are some of the non-invasive treatment options, data supporting non-invasive ventilation briefly, and then talk a little bit about invasive versus non-invasive uh, ventilation. All right, so this is really an overview of the respiratory pump which involves not only the breathing muscles like the diaphragm, but also the brain, both the cortex, the higher function centers, as well as the brain stem, the spinal cord, and then the motor nerves that um, go out to the muscles. And there are disease processes that can affect every one of these sites in the respiratory pump. And in clinic, I see many patients who have different problems along this way. Polio actually affects the motor nerves here, as does uh, ALS. There are other problems in the spinal cord, and then there are a whole wide variety of muscle diseases that can affect the uh, breathing system. The respiratory muscles, which I think are critical to kind of understanding what problems we can get into, um, I really divide into three parts. Uh, the inspiratory muscles that serve to allow us to enlarge the rib cage in the lung and bring air into the lung consist of the diaphragm, which is shown here. It's a large kind of dome-shaped muscle dividing the chest from the abdomen. Uh, but there are also uh, rib muscles that through their contraction can expand the rib cage. There are the expiratory muscles, which are ones that we don't think about that often, but in fact, the abdominal muscles here and then other rib muscles actually help us during exhalation. So if we're exercising and doing a lot of breathing, we'll use those, but also, and more importantly, during cough, which is critical to maintain the health of the respiratory system, um, these muscles are functioning. Then lastly, uh, upper airway muscles, so muscles that control the tongue, the swallowing mechanism. Uh, also, I consider respiratory muscles because the nerves that go to them actually are similar to the ones that go to the diaphragm and other breathing muscles. 
and again for airway protection those upper airway muscles are absolutely critical to keeping particles, saliva, etc., out of the lower respiratory tract. All right. So, uh, the way that I kind of think about this, because I'm sort of, uh, I like to break things down into simple uh, parts, is that when I see patients with neuromuscular disease, I really think about which one, or perhaps all three, of the types of respiratory failure or insufficiency might they have? And I divide it up into what I call inspiratory failure, um, kind of expiratory failure, which is cough failure, and then swallowing failure. Most breathing doctors kind of only think of inspiratory failure. So when people get into trouble, they can't breathe enough, they end up in the ICU, um, and that's what most of us kind of think about, but in fact, in the outpatient setting, those are at least as important, if not more so. We'll talk about each one of these more in detail in a moment. Okay. So, what is inspiratory failure, the first kind of breathing failure? That is when, either due to nerve problems or muscle problems, the diaphragm and the chest wall <coughs> muscles are weak. Um, what this results in is a reduction in what we call vital capacity, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, and also Helen Kent in the next talk will. Um, you also get a reduction in what's called the inspiratory force, the maximal pressure that you can uh, generate when you breathe in. When you get significant enough weakness of the inspiratory muscles, you will get what's called hypoventilation, not breathing enough. And this causes an elevation in the carbon dioxide level, um, which can give us a lot of symptoms. It's usually first seen at night. Um, and the reason that it's usually first seen at night is because during sleep, Every one of us in the room, whether we have neuromuscular weakness or not, has less breathing output from the brain at night to the breathing muscles. So if you have weak muscles and you're asleep and have less output of nerve stimulation to the muscles, you will get into trouble with very complicated, what we call sleep disordered breathing. Another term for this is sleep apnea, but it's much more complicated than the kind of standard obstructive sleep apnea that you hear about. The symptoms that people get with this can be subtle, but we ask them about headaches in the morning, about awakening at night for whatever reason, whether it's just they feel uncomfortable or have to go to the bathroom, night sweats, very uh, vivid nightmares, uh, lethargy in the morning, just not having energy, even depression and hypertension can be symptoms of sleep disordered breathing. The frequency of inspiratory failure and sleep problems is much greater when the vital capacity drops to about 50% or less. And that's a number that we keep in our minds so that when people get down there, but sometimes even before if they have symptoms, we're looking very closely for sleep problems. There are other changes that can occur in the respiratory system because of this weakened uh, state of the inspiratory muscles and the spine muscles. And one of them, and this particularly affects people with post-polio syndrome, is that you can get kyphoscoliosis, a bending of the spine that can occur that leads to smaller lung volumes. In addition, with weak <coughs> respiratory or spine muscles, you can get atelectasis or collapse of certain parts of the lung that can lead to low oxygen levels in the blood. You can also get mucus plugging and, um, as we're gonna talk about more later, low oxygen, but in general, the low oxygen is associated with an increased level of CO2 in the bloodstream. Okay. So sleep, as I already mentioned, um, is a particularly high risk time for people with neuromuscular weakness. Um, there's decreased output to the breathing muscles and that's particularly during rapid eye movement or dream sleep 
where output can drop as low as 30% less than during normal breathing. Um, what will happen um, is not only are the uh, inspiratory muscles weak, but also frequently upper airway muscles uh, are weak as well, so you can get obstructive apnea where the airway blocks off, as well as what we call central apnea, where weak muscles cannot generate any uh, uh, flow into the lungs. This is a picture of monitoring during sleep. And for those of you who might not be familiar with it, this is what we call transcutaneous CO2 here. And that's this line there. And that's measuring the CO2 levels in the bloodstream through a sensor that's placed on the skin. Um, we all, uh, in this picture, is also measured the saturation of blood with oxygen, and that should usually be 90 to 100. That's shown here. And what you can see is that during REM sleep, the oxygen saturation drops dramatically. This is a really a serious drop, and the carbon dioxide level goes up, and then it goes up again when they go into REM sleep. And this is evidence of significant sleep disorder, breathing, or hypoventilation. Now the issue with this is that one, it disturbs people's sleep and they don't have as much energy as they should normally, but over time, very low oxygen levels and high CO2 levels can lead to damage to organs such as the heart, which are placed under stress with low oxygen. All right, I think we've already gone through the symptoms of sleep disordered breathing. So how do we assess inspiratory function in the clinic? Again, Helen's going to go through that in detail, but we do what's called a forced vital capacity, which is breathing in and then breathing out as far as you can, the biggest breath that you can take. And we do that mostly in the upright position, but also we have patients lie down, particularly when we think they may have diaphragm muscle weakness. Um, we also measure maximal inspiratory pressure, where we put a little... Um, a device in their mouth and a pressure manometer and we have them suck in as hard as they can and that gives us um, kind of a sense of the muscle strength. In our clinic we always get a measure of CO2 and up until gosh maybe eight or nine years ago we used to do arterial blood gases and if you've had one of those you know those are not that pleasant. Um, so for people who do not have underlying lung disease, so they don't have asthma, emphysema, have not been long-time smokers, we do end tidal CO2 where we actually have them exhale into cannula attached to a machine that measures CO2. And uh, we've shown that that's quite reliable as a measure of carbon dioxide. Many hospitals have these for inpatient use. Rarely do they use it in the outpatient setting. Um, transcutaneous, again, that little patch on the skin connected to a machine, is getting more popular. The devices are a little bit less reliable and more difficult to deal with, so we have not been using those as much. Now, um, what do you do to treat people? Uh, who have sleep disordered breathing and inspiratory muscle failure. Well, um, basically, we have a whole raft of devices um, that can be used at night. And this is called, as a general rule, non-invasive ventilation. You will hear it called BiPAP. That is technically is a trade name from uh, a company. Um, so the real term that we use is non-invasive ventilation, but over the years, a wide variety of masks have come into use that can be used with devices at the bedside. And it's really been a blessing because in the beginning there were only two or three masks. Not all patients' noses fit those masks. And uh, so it's been, it's been really terrific to have all these. The machines also uh, have undergone tremendous development. Um, you know, as you'll see outside at the table, some of these machines are tiny now. They're all extremely quiet. 
And what they do is basically to breathe for the individual who is not breathing enough at night when they fall asleep. Uh, the machines interact with the patient, that is the patient can trigger it when they want a breath. We often do put in what's called a backup rate, so if the patient stops breathing entirely, they will still get breaths. And the pressure levels um, that are used can be adjusted at home, um, either by respiratory therapists from the home care company or sometimes by the patients themselves. So, very, very effective treatment, relatively inexpensive, uh, I would say. Uh, the coverage <laughs> for these devices ha has become a bit of an issue of late. Um, through the ACCP and other organizations, we've been trying to kind of wrestle with this and make sure that these things stay covered for people who need them. All right. So what are indications? When should one think about starting all this? Well, um, if you have a diagnosis of neuromuscular disease, really of any variety, you have symptoms and you have physiologic signs. So a vital capacity less than 50%, inspiratory pressure less than 60, carbon dioxide level greater than 45, or a sleep study uh, being positive, you can qualify for one of these machines. So in fact, many of these are not that difficult to qualify for. Most of our patients, I would say, rarely have a maximum inspiratory pressure greater than that. So if they have symptoms, we are able to get one of these for them in the home. And that's a godsend because there are other types of patients where it's not as easy to get. All right. Uh, let me skip over that. This is really, I think, for the therapist, but we generally start with pretty low pressures to get people on and used to the, uh, the bi-level device, um, but we will oftentimes write orders so that the inspiratory pressure, the one that's actually inflating the lungs, can be dialed up as needed per the patient um, needs. Now, a lot of people ask me, do you send your patients for sleep studies, right? Because this is all happening at night. Don't you send them to the sleep lab and get a formal study that costs about $1,000 or $1,500? And I hope there are no sleep doctors in here, but no. Um, I, I rarely send them because a lot of the labs are not set up to take care of patients with neuromuscular disease who may need an attendant, who um, may need a bed that goes to different angles and so forth, and they're just not really cognizant of the type of problems that we have. So I usually get people started on this based on the physiologic and symptom criteria. It's much more straightforward. Um, we can do a, generally a much better job with that. Um, now, sometimes inspiratory failure, you know, ventilation failure, can occur during the daytime. So you've treated the patient very nicely at night, but they're still having symptoms during the daytime or they're having recurrent pneumonias or things like that. Um, we will sometimes put them on daytime ventilation. Most people who would do this would show up with a carbon dioxide that's elevated despite um, having had good nighttime therapy. Um, and the question is, what, what can you do for people? And the answer to that is there's a lot to do. There are invasive forms of ventilation, and I will tell you up front that we've tried to avoid those at our center because we think that tracheostomy, which is what invasive ventilation is, meaning a hole in the neck with a tube there, uh, is not necessary, particularly for people with neuromuscular disease. We have gone uh, predominantly with non-invasive ventilation, and there are a number of things that can be done. Um, you can use a mask during the day, and I'll show you a picture of that, but we've used a lot of what's called mouthpiece ventilation, and it's very appropriate that we're talking about that here today because this was developed 
during the polio epidemics of the 1950s. This is not something that I uh, invented. Um, it was to get people out of the iron lung so that they could breathe on their own or with a mouthpiece uh, and get nursing care. Uh, in the older days, we used to use some what were called body ventilators, uh, particularly what was called a pneumo belt, an inflatable belt that went over the abdomen that pushed air out of the lungs. And then when gravity affected the diaphragm, air would come into the lungs. I don't think we've used that in about 10 years or more. There are a lot of disadvantages to invasive ventilation, and you can imagine having a hole in your neck uh, placed surgically can cause a lot of problems, and I've noted them here. Uh, a lot of the issues deal with suctioning, putting a catheter down there to get secretions out. And in our state, um, if you're going to get attendance paid for by medical insurance, they have to have an RN degree in many cases, or at least an associate's degree in nursing, and that is a very, very expensive. So if we can avoid that, that can really help the patient's financial uh, issues. Okay, so what do we do instead? This is a young man who actually had Duchenne muscular dystrophy, but this is the mouthpiece ventilation that I was mentioning, and what it is is a mouthpiece with a little angle in it that creates a high pressure in the circuit, and it's connected on the back of the chair to a ventilator. So the person can go around on their own with independent breathing, even if they are in a wheelchair. It's oftentimes called SIP ventilation. You'll hear it referred to as that. But we use a portable ventilator that is generally not one of the pressure devices, like the bi-level devices, but it's volume cycled. It has an elbow in it that fools the ventilator into thinking that the pressure is there because the circuit is open. And normally, the ventilator would alarm, saying, my goodness, there's pressure loss in the circuit. But we kind of fool it. There are a lot of different ventilators that can be used with this, and in fact, there are a whole bunch coming on the market now um, that will be able to do this uh, and do both bi-level and the volume cycle ventilation that we're showing here. This is kind of what the setup looks like on a wheelchair. It's pretty tidy. Uh, oftentimes there's an extra battery that goes for the vent, but some of the more modern ventilators have a battery backup in them. Uh, sometimes we attach this to the wheelchair battery. Um, but uh, that's kind of what it looks like. It's very, very uh, good for the patient in terms of creating independence. Um, and actually, let me go back there. And one thing that the patients can do who need this is if they take a number of breaths from the ventilator, they can actually cough on their own if they have problems with coughing. So they take a <laughs> and they stretch the lungs and then they can cough <laughs> with more forcefulness because the lung and the chest are stretched to a bigger volume and the elasticity allows them to cough better. Now some of our patients, particularly patients with ALS, um, cannot use the mouthpiece because of weakness of the lips. And so we actually have on occasion devised setups where people can use a nasal mask during the day. And in fact, I believe in Britain, most of the neuromuscular patients that they see use nasal ventilation during the daytime. Now, we've always felt that, you know, it would be a little hard kind of socially to be out there with a mask on your face. But in fact, this gentleman, probably for a year and a half or two years, used this device 24-7. Um, and really, it did a lot of good things for him. So that is a possibility um, for those who have ALS and, and poor lip seal function. All right. Now, Angela asked me to talk specifically about why to avoid inappropriate oxygen use. This relates really closely to the 
inspiratory or ventilatory failure that I was talking about. And this is the most common mistake that we see or hear of. I always joke with Louis, who's my colleague, that um, I could go around the United States and just lecture from medical school to medical school about why people should do more than have an oximeter measurement from their finger. So what is this? Okay, here's kind of the, the physiologic diaphragm, diagram, excuse me. So here are the lungs. What this is, is those are the little air sacs that we call alveoli at the end, bottom of the lung that are the kind of action area. They're the blood vessels, they're the air spaces. And so what happens is oxygen comes in from the environment, it goes down into the alveoli and into the bloodstream. Carbon dioxide comes out of the blood vessels and is exhaled into the environment. So what happens when people have weak muscles for whatever reason and they have ventilatory failure is that carbon dioxide will go up, okay, because you're not breathing out as much carbon dioxide as you should. Oxygen levels will go down because when you don't refresh the air in the alveolus, it doesn't get into the bloodstream. But the problem is, is that the pulse oximeter that they put on the finger probe only measures the oxygen level in the bloodstream. It doesn't measure the carbon dioxide level. So, you're kind of fooled into thinking, ah, this patient must have a pneumonia or congestive heart failure, some other cause of low oxygen, when the cause is that the CO2 is actually elevated. When you put oxygen onto somebody who has elevated carbon dioxide level, what it does is in the brain stem, okay, it actually blunts the person's drive to breathe. So higher oxygen levels reduce the need to breathe. So what happens is, oh gosh, the oximeter is now reading a great level, but my carbon dioxide level went from 50 to 80, right? The normal carbon dioxide level is 40. When it starts to go above 45, that's abnormal. When you put oxygen onto somebody and it's 45, 50, and it goes up to 80, all of a sudden, the acid level in the bloodstream goes up because carbon dioxide is an acid. Carbon dioxide is also a narcotic to the brain, and so people can actually become comatose from high CO2 levels. I have heard of people who have gone into the emergency room, had oxygen put on, the doctor came back later, they were comatose, they ended up being intubated, they aspirated during the intubation and died during the hospitalization because the person did not do a blood gas where you can measure carbon dioxide level as well, just did the oximetry. Um, <laughs> I think Dr. John Bach, who's a well-known uh, uh, physician in this area, actually has on a website that he developed a little card that you can take with you to give to the emergency room doctor that says, do not ever give me oxygen without giving me some kind of ventilatory support. So it's absolutely fine to give oxygen if you have a bi-level you know, ventilator on you or you have some other kind of ventilatory support, it's using the oxygen alone that's the problem. So, for whatever you have to do, those of you who have neuromuscular disease, tell your doctor, tell the people in the emergency room that you're somebody where carbon dioxide elevation is a real risk, okay? All right, now, um, we talked about inspiratory or ventilatory failure. The second kind of failure, which is really almost just as important, is what I call cough insufficiency or cough failure. It actually relates to all three parts of the breathing system, the inspiratory muscles, the abdominal expiratory muscles, and the airway or uh, upper airway muscles. The problem with cough, is um, that when you cannot cough, you cannot clear secretions. When you cannot clear secretions, 
you will develop that collapse of the lung or atelectasis and infection. People who have cough problems can have it because their abdominal muscles are weak or because their glottis cannot close or because they can't take a deep enough breath in to get enough air into the lungs to cough effectively. What uh, is done to measure this in the clinic is what's called uh, peak cough flow measurement. This is a very inexpensive measuring device. Um, it is an asthma peak flow meter with a little face mask, and I would say it costs about $15 for a clinic to have. Uh, it's actually been studied in the scientific literature, and what you do is you put the mask on the patient, you have them take a breath in and cough as hard as they can, and you measure that. And for any people who have normal respiratory function, the normal value for that is about 500 to 600 liters per minute. Um, when it's been looked at, a value of 270 liters per minute or less when the person is healthy and in clinic correlates with somebody who may get sick during an infection and have a lower cough flow that will be ineffective in getting secretions out of the lung. Um, therefore, for our clinic, if we have somebody who has this value or less we're concerned about their cough and we instruct them in cough augmentation techniques and some people we provide with a device that you will see in a moment to help them with cough. Now you can measure maximal expiratory pressure and some people say that a value uh, of less than 60 is consistent with cough muscle weakness. We do not measure that routinely in, in clinic. All right. So what can you do to help cough if you have a low peak cough flow? There are a lot of different things that can be done. Assisted coughing, where a helper actually presses on the abdomen or the lateral rib cage. We give almost all of our patients what's called a resuscitation bag or an AMBU bag, where they can actually, again, inflate the lungs to get the elastic recoil that elasticity to get particles out of the lungs. And then there's a cough assist device or an inexiflator um, that can be used as well. This is assisted coughing. It's sometimes called quad coughing because it's used for people with spinal cord injury. But it can be very uh, effective in getting uh, cough flows up. This is that AMBU bag that increases the lung elasticity. Um, you need to have good lip seal function, so oral strength is important there. And this is the cough assist device. And it is a device that, again, was developed in the 1950s uh, during the polio epidemics, um, but is available today. It's a machine that acts really like a vacuum cleaner for the airways. It gives you a little positive pressure or volume in and then quickly moves to a negative pressure and really kind of vacuums out the airway. It is incredibly effective for those who need it. This is the device. This is where we adjust pressures and these are the pressures that we use in general. Um, but it's adjusted for each individual uh, patient. Okay. All right, now, the last failure, glottic failure, is a particularly difficult kind of failure. That means swallowing failure. Um, the reason it is difficult is because the risk of aspiration goes up dramatically when swallowing is not well coordinated. Um, it's intimately related to cough function, so not only do people often have problems swallowing who have what's called bulbar or glottic dysfunction, um, but they also have cough uh, insufficiency. They may have difficulty in managing secretions, choking episodes and aspiration, and then pneumonia and respiratory failure. 
particularly for our ALS patients, this is an issue, but also some types of muscular dystrophy can have bulbar involvement. Post-polio syndrome, for those that had the bulbar form of polio, can involve um, the glottis and swallowing function on occasion. Okay, so what do we do to assess this? Um, we mostly go by history, but we also have a speech and swallowing clinic where we send many of our patients, and they will do a barium swallow study to look at the function of the swallowing muscles during uh, various maneuvers. Uh, the otolaryngologists or ear, nose, and throat doctors can actually look at the swallowing function now with an endoscope where they're actually looking at the airway and, and esophagus. Okay, let's go. What do we do to treat swallowing problems? There are a number of things that can be done. These are usually uh, taught by the swallowing uh, specialists. But keeping the head down and the chin tucked down actually can uh, improve the pathway to the esophagus or food tube. So people, rather than tilting their head up like that, should actually keep the chin tucked during swallowing. Um, thin liquids tend to be more difficult, so often liquid thickeners are given to patients. Uh, we tell them about avoiding dry and bulky foods. There are also a number of medicines that can uh, assist in managing secretions uh, that can be given. If somebody cannot manage despite all of these things and are still aspirating, then the question of tracheostomy comes up. Um, but again, it's something that we rarely use uh, except in the most difficult cases. Gastrostomy tube can also be helpful. Again, for our ALS patients, we find this incredibly helpful for them um, because it maintains weight uh, it maintains hydration and it prevents aspiration as well. Okay. Um, go on. Um, the gastrostomy tube, we have actually done, and I'm going to show you in the surgical talk that I give later, that you can actually use non invasive ventilation to place one of these tubes safely without general anesthesia. So that's been a real advance for many of our patients. Okay. So, with all of this, with the inspiratory failure, the cough failure, the um, swallowing failure, when must tracheostomy be considered seriously? Um, and there are a number of times when I think it should be considered. If there is very significant glottic dysfunction with increased risk of aspiration that is not responsive to the maneuvers I talked about. If you're getting recurrent pneumonias and you're on full-time non-invasive ventilation, if you have an elevated carbon dioxide level despite optimal full-time non-invasive ventilation, occasionally we'll have patients who would prefer this to full-time non-invasive ventilation. They feel more secure with that. And sort of unfortunately, but if you're not near a center that does non-invasive ventilation on a full-time basis, I would say the likelihood of ending up with a tracheostomy is higher, which is unfortunate. Um, <clears throat> I go around and my colleague Louis Boitano goes around a lot trying to educate people how to do this. It's catching on more than it was previously, but still I would say we've got an uphill battle to get more centers involved. Okay, tracheostomy ventilation is a major decision. Patients can live for many, many years with this. If someone has both tracheostomy ventilation and other impairments that require you know, caregiving, full-time caregiving is not often covered by insurance. This is a really bad part of our medical system in that it is called custodial care when somebody needs suctioning and let's say help with activities of daily living. Insurers do not consider that medical care. 
and they will not pay for it. And when we've done estimates, we get uh, values of about $150,000 per year, and that's if you hire your own caregivers. So uh, really a painful problem, I would say, and it's because of technicalities of what they're calling the care. Um, in addition, for the family, and this has been researched, but taking care of somebody at home on a ventilator and other needs leads to caregiver burnout over time. Um, there's a need for respite care for the family members, um, and that often, again, is not covered by insurance. We often talk with our patients well in advance of the time that they might need this to have them decide because it's always much harder to make in a critical situation. So when you show up at the ER with a pneumonia and they put you on a ventilator and then you have to decide, I think it's much better to be made in advance. Okay, so I think I'm done a little early. We'll have plenty of time for um, questions. To summarize, I would say neuromuscular patients are at very high risk of breathing problems that can lead to respiratory failure and pneumonia for the reasons that I've detailed. There are three general facets of the breathing failure and I suggest that at each clinic visit that measurements or at least a history be taken to evaluate each of those uh, areas of concern. Uh, Bi-level NPPV that is often referred uh, to as BiPAP can improve quality and length of life and I didn't show you any data on that but for neuromuscular diseases as a whole for people who have CO2 elevation and nighttime uh, breathing kind of pre-post studies have shown dramatic improvements in carbon dioxide levels and length of life and I would say that really for most patients with neuromuscular disease who have low vital capacity or elevated CO2 and symptoms of sleep disordered breathing, it should be offered to them. And um, I think this is a, a, a critical area where education around the country uh, is important. So I will stop there and I think we can um, Oh, oh, I did have one more slide, I'm sorry. Excuse me. This was kind of a, a, a slide that I had prepared for a, another talk, but I thought it was really important here. And it's kind of uh, like being your best advocate in uh, terms of preventing problems. So flu shot and pneumonia shot I would say would be important for all people with neuromuscular disease and respiratory problems. I tell people not to have sick folks come around their house during the season when things are high. Even if it's like grandchildren and all that, I say have them come back in a week or two when they're better. I tell them to have hand sanitizers in the house right at the doorway. Everybody who comes in should sanitize their hands. You should be looking for symptoms of sleep problems. So if you're having disturbance of sleep or headaches in the morning, you should talk with your doctor about that. If you have recurrent infections or what you feel is a weak cough, that can be helped. So that should be brought up with a doctor. I would say everybody with um, neuromuscular disease and any respiratory involvement should have at least an annual vital capacity uh, measurement. Um, we also do the cough flow and the maximum inspiratory pressures at least once a year and if it's a more rapidly progressive disease we do it more often. If you visit the ER Oxygen may be given, but carbon dioxide checks must be undertaken. That generally means a blood gas in the emergency room. And if you're somebody who is known to have CO2 elevation, um, you should be given ventilation if you're going to be given oxygen. Okay, and that's it.
So, any any questions for Dr. Bendit? We have uh, someone with microphones. My question is, I want to this. <laughs> <laughs> Superb. My question is uh, answered by your last slide. Some of us uh, were assessed and then given a uh, bi-level machine uh -huh. to uh -huh. and we go on and on and on and on uh, year after year year after year, and uh, we don't get assessed again, but you're saying that we should have an annual assessment. Absolutely. No, that's a great question. Now, Did when we go to the hospital and have that assessment, uh, what good is that going to do us? Okay. Uh, that's a really good question. So you're put on the treatment for sleep disordered breathing, but you're not followed up. So there are a few ways that that's done, but probably the most important one is a combination of how you're feeling, all right? So a lot of people, when they come in and they're started on the bi-level devices, uh, they notice an improvement. Even though uh, some of the symptoms were subtle, they have higher energy, you know, they're feeling refreshed in the morning and all that. So if the symptoms start to come back, that's very, very important. We also continue to monitor not only the vital capacity, but that CO2 level. So if that starts to climb up again, that's an indication that you need an increase in the, uh, you know, in the pressure. If we're not sure, so maybe the CO2 level is not going up, the patient's having symptoms, we're not sure if it's related, that's the time when we will send people to the sleep lab. Because out of all the tests, for those who can get into the lab and where the test is done well, that's probably the most accurate way of assessing the treatment effect. And you can actually wear the bi-level device and they can do what's called a titration study where they actually adjust it until it's just right. I would say we don't do it that often because the other factors tell us what's going on, particularly the symptoms of the patient. I, I would like to address your question. Basically, there is no form of payment. The best way to monitor our patients that are on non-invasive positive pressure ventilation would be with a forced vital capacity every year or with a MIP every year or an end tidal CO2, but there is no form of payment. So our patients are lucky because when they come in, we monitor them all the time. But to call, call you into my office is going to cost me money and there's no form of payment. I really think that something should be done with our neuromuscular patients to give you that annual checkup, and it's cheaper in the home than it is to send you into a facility, but there is no form of payment. Sure. We get a, oh. Okay. Sure. Uh-huh. Yes. Sure. I think for, for a very young, you know, a child like that, absolutely. I think a sleep study is the best way to go. Um, the most of the pediatric hospitals will have a specialized lab associated with them. And actually, uh, they're much better at dealing with patients with neuromuscular disease than the adult clinics. And the reason that is, is because in the adult world, you know, I don't know what the, it is, but you know, well over 75% of what they're seeing is obstructive sleep apnea. People without neuromuscular disease who are overweight, and male, 60, you know, that kind of thing. So they're not used to dealing with it, but the pediatric sleep labs are much better because it's much higher incidence in their practice. 
So yes, for a very young child, definitely. And they'll do, almost automatically, they will do the titration studies. The key for uh, a very young person like that is they might prescribe CPAP now, but you want to make sure that later down the line they may need bilevel rather than just the single uh, pressure level. For those of you who don't know, CPAP is just a single pressure, relieves <coughs> obstruction. Uh, bilevel obviously has the, the bilevel pressures, um, but down the line, he may need that. So, yeah. Oops, got one back. Dr. Bennett? Yes. Uh, Bendit. Yes. yes. Uh, are you associated with the post polio sleep study of the university up there? At the University of Washington? Yeah. Uh, I am not. Um, right. Interesting. We have a, a sleep lab, and there's a director of that who's associated with us, but he has not mentioned that to me. Uh, so that's good to know. There is currently an ongoing study of sleep in post polio patients. Yes, uh, okay. and I believe I've got my facts right because I'm part of that study. Okay. And I think, <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure it's uh, at the Washington Medical, uh, University of Washington, no, Medical Center where you're from. Okay. Up in Seattle. Um, they're in their second uh, phase. I think it's uh -huh. a three or four phase study. Okay. It'll be interesting to see the results, of oh, course. Oh, absolutely. But but my real question is the uh -huh. following. I'm from Las Vegas, Nevada, uh -huh. and I've been fighting my insurance company, been fighting my doctors uh, to do a supine uh, pulmonary function test. Uh -huh. Now, I've been keeping my cool as I've gone down to a 47% lying down uh -huh. breathing capacity uh -huh. level which was uh, noticed by a cardiologist that I asked to do it because none of the hospital respiratory departments, my respiratory, my pulmonologist doesn't seem to know about it. He thinks mm -hmm. I'm crazy. Mm -hmm. um, what can I do about getting one? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you, you are right. Most PFT labs, pulmonary function labs, are not <laughs> equipped to do that. Um, there are both tables and certain kinds of chairs that can do that quickly. And we have those at our place because we kind of just pushed it through. But you're absolutely correct. I'd say probably the most likely way to get that done would be to get a respiratory therapist who, I, I don't know if you have any relationship with them, but to do it in clinic. Uh, a lot of the clinic exam tables will go flat, and if you can get one of them to come to clinic and just have you lie flat there, that's probably the easiest, because most of the PFT labs, it takes months to get any change in protocol through. So I think that's the best way, but I, I agree with you. It's very hard, despite the fact that for neuromuscular patients, it can be very, very helpful. So right. yeah, I, I, I'm sorry to hear that, it's tough. Yeah, yeah, I have bulbar polio, by the way. Oh, okay. I had it, and um, so what I'm trying to do now is through the nighttime oximetry tests, which uh -huh. they do allow, uh -huh. um, <laughs> Unfortunately, when they're doing it, it's not catching my uh, CO2 levels going right. down below uh, 88, let's say, with uh, 90, I guess is the, the borderline, uh, long enough right. to For get anybody minutes. to do anything about it. So I want to buy a Respironix uh, machine, I forgot which number it was, an oximetry mas a machine that's that takes the reading all through the night, and then you return it to the uh, DME, uh -huh. and they'll give you the readout. Sure. The only thing is, is I want to be able to buy the software for that too to take the reading, because uh, if you're going to go through the expense of buying the thing, why not get the software and the downloadable capability, sure. and know when, you know, because eventually it's going to come. Sure. Or, and go ahead. 
Well, I was just going to say if, if, the, if you're trying to qualify for uh, a bi level device, I, I don't know if you have one. I have one. one. Oh, I you've got one, one already. Yeah. Okay, so you're, uh, yeah, well, then that's true. Those are the, the uh, recording devices are pretty expensive, but uh, you could probably get them. Um, so when they, the home care company who's working with you, they're not able to send you home with a recording device? Like they, an overnight? They bring over a recording device, goes back, and then they read it, okay? Uh -huh. I was, but as things get worse, I want to be able to monitor my own. Got it. Uh -huh. and, and so I want to buy one, but it's the software for that's getting right. hard to find. Right. Okay. Okay. Question. Um, I'm uh, um, been surviving with ALS for about five years, and and um, I'm using a bilevel therapy over uh, over. At night, okay. I, at night time, I've been using okay. bilevel right. therapy, uh -huh. and um, I set it up with like, like what you said, ten over four, uh -huh. and now I'm up to six, uh, IPAP of sixteen and five EPAP, and uh, now I'm getting to the point where the air is uh, distending my stomach, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that's giving me very uncomfortable mm. sure. and situation, and and then we. Uh, we, I have uh, you know, talked about with the doctor getting a peg just to vent the stomach, which doesn't seem to make sense. And, um, and the other option would be trach, which is not what I sure. want because no, I can absolutely. still speak. So um, I've, I've been using a little belt around the uh, abdominal area uh -huh. below the navel, not to obstruct the movement of the diaphragm. But uh, that seems to ac actually help me to be able to tolerate uh -huh. the pressure of 16. And uh -huh. uh, as the pressure of inspiratory pressure goes up, as, as the you know, lungs get stiffer, uh -huh. uh, this will become um, somewhat of a worse problem. And I was just wondering what suggestion you might have for this uh, That's issue. A, a great. It's an aerophagia. Sure, exactly. Yeah, the, the question of getting air into the stomach when you're using BiPAP, and that's a real problem, both for ALS as well as for some of the muscular dystrophies. We have not tried that belt. I think that's a clever idea. Um, we have actually had pretty good success with a peg tube with one of the devices that can vent off the air. And I think as a longer term solution, that might be a good one potentially. Um, what is the name of the device that you're talking about? What's the, uh, Louis, what's the name of the device? The uh, vent? The vent for the peg tube. Um, it's a ferrule valve. It's, How do you spell that? F-A-R-R-E, I think it's double L. Ferrule valve. But it's basically, it goes on the tube and it allows the air to be vented out of the... Uh, out of the stomach, and we've had good success with that. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah.